everybody, and welcome back to our series of companion guides to the Eye of the World, the first book in the Wheel of Time series. Today we're tackling chapter four of Eye of the World titled The Gleeman. Make sure to check out all the previous videos in this series as we're gonna be breaking down all of the chapters of Eye of the World. Now the video is gonna be broken down into two sections. The first section will be a basic recap of the chapter, but with additional maps and visual aids to help you understand what the heck just happened. This is designed for those of you that are reading the books for the very first time so that you can have a firm grasp on what you just read. There are not going to be any spoilers for anything really past chapter four of Eye of the World in this section. The second section of the video will be spoiler filled and will not only break down what happened in the chapter, but it's going to give additional analysis and talk about all of the foreshadowing, Easter eggs, and all the cool stuff you might have missed buried in the chapter. I'll throw up a spoiler warning before we get to this section so those of you that haven't finished the books completely can turn off the video. This entire video series is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible is the world's largest provider of audiobooks, and the Wheel of Time audiobooks are flat out awesome. Uh, it's my favorite way to reread the series at this point. Audible is offering a free audiobook to all of my viewers. All you have to do is head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash nabless, and you can pick up the free trial for the service. You're going to be able to keep that book whether you actually ever pay a dime for it or not, and you really greatly support the channel by doing so. Again, www.audibletrial.com forward slash nabless, or you can just find the link in the description of this video. So let's go ahead and recap chapter four of Eye of the World, titled The Gleeman. Now the chapter opens up where the previous chapter left off. Tom Marilyn, the Gleeman hired by the village to perform at the Beltine Festival, busts out of the Winespring Inn, upset at the village council for asking him to leave the inn as they go in there to discuss all that information that the peddler brought in the last chapter. Now Tom speaks with Rand, Egwene, Matt, and Perrin as they stand outside the inn. Tom notices Egwene and asks her to help him as his assistant when he performs tomorrow. He thinks she's pretty and he always picks pretty girls to help. Egwene agrees, but the boys want to hear more about the wars and the false dragons in Gildon and about Aes Sedai. Tom dismisses their questions as unimportant, and when he asks them their names, he compares Perrin's size to that of an Ogier, to which Perrin dismisses as a made-up creature from one of Tom's stories. Tom begins to mock their ignorance of the world as they boast about traveling as far as the next village, which, as he mocks them, Egwene starts to tell Tom that he shouldn't make fun of them, and so he agrees, and he goes on to give examples of then of his performance. He starts to juggle and he mentions stories that he's going to tell during the festival. He talks and he juggles and he attracts a crowd, including Moraine and Lan. Now at seeing Moraine, Tom immediately stops juggling and talking and gives a suspicious look to Moraine, even though he greets her cordially. Now Tom assures Moraine that he will not tell any stories that she won't like. She nods at him and then leaves. Now the crowd yells for more from Tom, but the village council finally leaves the inn as well as Nynaeve. Tom goes back into the inn immediately to sort of escape the crowd, and Tam comes over to the boys to tell them a bit about what the council discussed. The village council decided that the village and the two rivers as a whole were not any real danger from the wars, from the Aes Sedai, or from the false dragon, but that they were going to take some precautions and set a patrol or sort of a lookout patrol after the Beltine Festival around the two rivers. The boys volunteer to be a part of that patrol and Tam asks them why and they just wanna go out and do something. And so Tam says, fine, we'll talk about it after Beltine. And then he tells Rand that they're gonna head back to the farm. As they start back, Tam tells Rand that he believes Rand about the rider in black that the other boys had seen and that the council had spoken of other boys around Rand's age seeing the same rider. He tells Rand that that's why they're actually headed back to the farm for the night, to make sure that this isn't a thief or anything stealing stuff. The chapter ends as they head back along the quarry road towards their farm in the Westwood. So that's it for the recap of chapter four of Eye of the World. Now we're going to go ahead and jump into the spoiler section. The rest of this video is going to carry a spoiler rating of red, with major spoilers running all the way through the final book in the series. If you have not read all of the books of the Wheel of Time, Turn the video off and come back to it once you are. You're going to be spoiled. You've been warned. So let's hit on the major foreshadowing that goes on in the chapter. First of all, when Tom first appears and starts questioning the boys, he mentions that Rand's eyes are a different color from everyone else in the village. This is obviously setting up the fact that Rand is very different. In the same sentence, Tom says that Rand is as tall as an Aielman, which is another obvious reference to Rand being Aiel, 
much later and not originally from the Two Rivers. Now, when Tom starts telling the crowd about the stories that he's going to tell, he mentions very briefly that he will tell stories from when men lived as brothers to animals, foreshadowing the existence of Wolf Brothers and Perrin's story arc. Now, much later in the chapter, when Tam leaves the inn, he, Matt mentions that battles are very much interesting to him, which is an obvious attempt to set Matt up as the one who's going to be the, the guy into war and obviously get all these memories from battles much later. Now, this is also the first chapter in the books where there's a significant amount of Easter eggs to our time within the story. When Tom starts regaling the crowd with stories that he's going to tell, he mentions a number of stories that are very obvious references to our time. Egwene also mentions a few. So let me run through these for you. The first is a reference to Anla the Wise Counselor, which is a reference to advice columnist Anne Landers. There's also a reference here to Jame the Giant Slayer, which is a reference, of course, to the story of Jack the Giant Killer. Mara in the Three Foolish Kings isn't a reference to our time that we know of, but it is a story that Tom will tell multiple times throughout the story. Maybe that belongs more in the foreshadowing section, but I'll mention it here. This is going to come up again, so you'll see it. Egwene mentions Len and flying to the moon in an eagle made of fire. Now, that's sort of an amalgamation of stories from NASA. So from John Glenn being the first American to orbit the Earth to the eagle being the spaceship that carried the first astronauts to the moon. That's what Len and flying to the moon in an eagle made of fire seems to be referring to. Egwene also mentions Salia, which is a reference to Sally Ride, the first American woman in space. Tom mentions Mosk the giant in his lance of fire that could reach around the world, which is a reference to ICBMs in the Soviet Union with Moscow being Mosk. In a later book, Merck will come up battling Mosk, which is a reference to America and Russia or America in the USSR. Now keep in mind the original, the first couple books of these were written when the Soviet Union was still a thing, even though it was falling apart. We also get references to Elsbeth, Queen of All, which is likely a reference to Queen Elizabeth or Queen Victoria or both. And then Ma Therese, the healer, which is a reference to Mother Teresa. Now Tom mentions stories of previous ages ending with fire from the sky or with cold and ice. Now this might be a reference to other ages ending with like a meteor strike or an ice age or something similar. We don't have much of an idea what happens in the other ages of the Wheel of Time, so this might be one clue to that. Lastly, let's hit some general thoughts. One thing is that Tom apparently knows or is familiar with Padon Fane. Tom refers to Fane as always carrying some bad news. Apparently Fane is either a fairly successful merchant that's known to a lot of people, or Tom has crossed his path multiple times, but they do seem to know each other. Another thing of note here is that Tom immediately recognizes Moraine for being an Aes Sedai, but never says so out loud. You can kind of see this in the way that he reacts when he sees her, and the coded language that they use back and forth to each other as they interact. He seems hesitant to use her name, and she corrects him to make sure that, that he calls her what she wants rather than an Aes Sedai. Now, it would make sense given that Tom knows Aes Sedai and that he's had dealings with them before. Now, this does bring up, though, the one question or unanswered question, I should say, from the chapter that ties into that point. Tom clearly recognized Moraine for what she is, given that he has traveled the world, how come Tam Thor didn't? He has traveled the world as well. He's been to Tarvalin. He seems to have a familiarity with Aes Sedai later when he talks to Rand. So it's curious we don't see him mentioning Moraine being an Aes Sedai. But I suppose this could be explained away in that we don't actually see Tam interact with her yet. Or even see her yet. So it's possible maybe that he didn't know she was there. But anyways, guys, make sure to let me know what you think of this chapter in the comments below. Also, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release new Wheel of Time content. That is all I do on this channel. Make sure to check out all of my other Wheel of Time content that's already up on the channel. Additionally, make sure to get your free audiobook from Audible by heading to www.audibletrial.com forward slash Nablus or by clicking the link in the description of this video. Now, depending on when you watch this, there are going to be more chapter reviews in order for the entire book, so make sure to check out the playlist. Thank you for watching, and until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do. My mistress up above, slipping on a robe of blue. She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free, crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?